Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Tiger Gao. My guest today is David McCormick. He is the CEO of Bridgewater Associates, the world's largest hedge fund with over $140 billion in asset under management. David joined Bridgewater in 2009 and was president and co-CEO before becoming CEO in 2020. And prior to Bridgewater, he was the U.S. Treasury Undersecretary for International Affairs in the George W. Bush administration during the 2008 global financial crisis. And he also had senior roles on the National Security Council and in the Department of Commerce. David is a graduate of the United States Military Academy, a former Army officer and a veteran of the first Gulf War, and has a PhD from Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. David, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a great honor to have you on the show. Hey, great to see you, Tiger. Thanks for having me. Maybe we can start the interview with your early days as a student and as a cadet, since I'm a student. Uh, after graduating from West Point in 1987, you joined the Army's 82nd Airborne Division as the U.S. inched towards the first Gulf War. You also then earned your Ph.D. from Princeton School of Public International Affairs in 1996 after having served in the Gulf War. So maybe we could start there. Could you tell us about some of the formative experiences you had at West Point? in the Army and at Princeton? Sure. Yeah, well, Princeton, well, uh, I'll maybe start with Princeton and then go backwards. Princeton was a really um, special uh, uh, four years in my life. And I remember as a, um, as a graduate as a student uh, teaching with Aaron Friedberg. Uh, Aaron Friedberg was one of my dissertation advisors. And I remember walking across campus and thinking to myself, if I would ever be so lucky to have a kid that could go to Princeton because it was like such a special place. And I thought the undergraduate experience there was, uh, was, was so amazing. And I also really felt privileged to be there for me. You know, I hadn't been a great student at West Point, um, a decent student, but not a great student. And uh, I came to um, Princeton to do the MPA program. And um, I had a, I had a couple professors that really took an interest in me. I, I first of all, I've been an engineer and, uh, and when I left the army, I had had about a year until graduate school was going to start, so I traveled around the world, and um, I uh, bought a TWA ticket that was five thousand dollars at the time, and you could take as many flights as you wanted, as, you, as long as you went in the same direction. And so I spent three or four months in the Middle East and uh, in all sorts of interesting places like Turkey and Syria and Jordan and Egypt, and then I spent uh, another three or four months in Asia, uh, in Borneo and uh, Thailand and, and eventually China. And, um, and so I came into the grad school uh, experience with like the very narrow army experience, but then also this recent uh, kind of opening up to the world. And, um, and I was very intimidated, very intimidated by Princeton and all the, uh, the smart students. And I had this uh, professor named Dick Allman, uh, who has uh, since died, who, uh, who was my foreign policy uh, professor. And he, um, he was just a, a wonderful guy and had taken an interest in former military people. He had a number of people he advised as former military people. And I remember uh, getting my first paper back uh, that I submitted to him. And it, um, it just had very light uh, ink or uh, uh, lead rather, where it had A, B, C, and then you leave through the paper and then it double A, double B, double C with pencil. And then you turn to the back of the paper and stapled on it are comments, A, B, C, and the comments were longer than the paper. And, um, and it was just uh, emblematic of really not being able to write or think very well at all. And this wonderful man taking the time to help teach me how to think and, and, to, uh, and to write. And, uh, and so four years later, I finished with a PhD. But it was because of Dick, Aaron Freeberg, and others who took this really active interest. And I would have never imagined... Um, you know, succeeding uh, as I did at Princeton um, from those early days, but those people taking an active interest. So that's that's the most memorable thing for uh, Princeton for me of these professors that took a special interest and gave me confidence and helped me uh, help me uh, make my way into the world. About halfway through the PhD, I figured I realized that I wasn't cut out to be a professor, and so I started to think about what was next. And I ultimately decided to go into business, and that started the next phase of my career. Uh, West Point was um, sort of similar in a in a incredible opening of of my mind. I came from a small town in Pennsylvania, uh, outside of Scranton. I played football and wrestled. I got recruited to do both at West Point, and I wanted to go to Penn State, 
but I wasn't a good enough football player to go to Penn State. And uh, my dad said, you don't have to go, but, but insisted that I apply to West Point. And uh, I applied and, uh, and to my surprise got in. And I thought to myself, well, I'm not, I'm, I don't, I'm not interested in the military. I, um, I, don't, I don't come from a military family, but my tiny town, this was a huge deal because uh, no one had gone to uh, any of the academies for years and it was in the newspaper and everybody just sort of assumed I was going to go to West Point. And, uh, and so uh, I ultimately decided to do that. And that was the best decision I ever made because West Point uh, was a way to serve the country. It was a way to learn. It was a great environment. I made some of my closest friends. And, um, and I learned a lot about, you know, the motto of West Point's duty on our country. And it's, it's all about service. And, uh, and that's been a big part of my career ever since is service, uh, service in the military, and then, uh, and, and then service in the, in the government. A, a final point on the Army, you ask about the 82nd. So uh, one of the things that uh, happens at West Point is you, depending on your class rank, you pick your unit and your, uh, uh, and your destination, what post you go to, your uh, post and branch. And so uh, I wasn't that high in the class. I don't remember exactly where it was, but I was, I don't think I was in the top quartile of the class, maybe the top quartile. So I wasn't a great student, but I really wanted to go to uh, a, um, a really uh, high uh, impact unit. You know, one of the units that was really a cutting edge unit. And so the 82nd at Fort Bragg was uh, the Army's um, rapid deployment force. And it's a parachute unit. And so I, uh, I, I selected that and I was fortunate enough to get that. And so I went to all the schools, you go into the army, airborne school and ranger school, and I ended up at Fort Bragg. And the amazing thing about that, which has been the experience that shaped everything that followed, was you're a 22 year old person and you're given a responsibility for a platoon. And so you walk into the platoon and there's these old grizzled veterans, uh, you know, your platoon sergeant has been in the, the army for 25 years and, and you've got these, uh, these people in the ranks and it's highly diverse. Uh, you have uh, black, white, uh, uh, Latino. It's a very mixed. It was all male unit at the time. It's, it's no longer the case. And, um, and these people are from rural America, uh, urban America, but they come together for this common purpose. And whatever preconceived notions they have, they quickly fade away as, uh, as you, know, you get into uh, training or in combat. Because what they really want is they want to be part of a team that where everybody's taking care of each other and they want to be well led. And so having that exposure uh, early on and that leadership opportunity really set the stage for everything that followed. So fast forward a few decades, uh, you eventually joined Bridgewater and Bridgewater is a place that needs very, very little introduction. So maybe could you tell us a little bit about Bridgewater's dis dis distinct culture of radical transparency, critical thinking and various other principles established by founder Ray Dalio and how you decided to join the firm from a government position and, and what the transition process has been like. Yeah, well, it, uh, it, it really sort of goes back to the treasury. So as, as you said, I was in the treasury during the financial crisis. And, um, and so I had a lot of exposure to um, media. I was in the media a lot and I was, um, I was in the global macroeconomic policy arena. So I would join all the meetings for the central bankers and the finance ministers. And, and so it was a little bit like dog years where my 18 months in the treasury felt like 10 years because there was so much activity jammed in there. And when, I, when um, President Obama was sworn into office, the way it works, you submit your resignation letter. And then the day of the inauguration, your resignation letter goes into effect and the new president is, uh, uh, is, is in office. And, uh, and after, after that day, I was sort of exhausted. You know, it'd been just a rapid sprint. And so I, I uh, took a an opportunity to be in a teaching, uh, in a sort of taught a class at Carnegie Mellon, uh, which was which had an office, which had a campus in DC, and I took about six months, and uh, I just sort of decompressed. And uh, you know, at, at one point, my wife said, uh, "You know, listen, you've been wearing sweatpants and not, not shaving for like weeks at a time. It's time for you to figure out what's next." And I had I had received a call from Bridgewater or from the recruiter, and um, I knew a little bit about Bridgewater, but not much. And so I went up for a visit and uh, I met Ray Dalio, who you mentioned, who was the, who's the founder. And, uh, and he's a, he's a somewhat intimidating guy. And, uh, you know, we didn't have a great conversation. And, uh, I, and so I remember getting in the car on the way to the airport and I talked to my wife and I said, um, that's, this isn't going to work out. Um, you know, I didn't particularly like him. He didn't particularly like me. It was awkward. And, um, so I'm, you know, I'm going to look, look to other things. And to my surprise, he called me and, uh, and asked me to come back. 
for another visit. And over the next three or four months, I went for a number of visits and I had another job uh, opportunity. And the other job opportunity, believe it or not, I had more money and it was a well-known firm and a, a big title. But for some reason, I kept coming back to Bridgewater and saying, I, I want to I wanna take a chance on that. And the reason I ultimately, and, and, and a funny story, Ray and I had the final sell dinner, all of you are seniors or you're a senior. So you know what the sell dinner is like, where you're kind of getting the, the final offer. And then Ray's sell dinner, he said, this is going to be great. Um, you know, you're going to be a great addition here. And I think you're going to likely be very successful. In fact, there's a 50-50 chance you're going to make it. And I thought, well, this is the sell dinner, like 50-50 chance I'm going to make it. But, uh, but that was classic Bridgewater. And it was what attracted me to Bridgewater, which was, A, it's a, it's a very forthright, open, radically transparent, as you said, place where people are encouraged, required to speak their mind. And that's based on the view that, uh, that to beat markets, you have to live in an environment where the best ideas prevail and that people live within an idea meritocracy where the ideas compete. And uh, ultimately, they're not based on who said them and how senior you are, but, but which idea makes the most sense. And, um, and so it's a very blunt, direct place. And that, that attracted me uh, because many places aren't that way. And then the second thing that attracted me is the people. Um, which were which were really um, very capable, talented people, but kind of quirky, like not mainstream, a little quirky, a little bit um, you know di- distinctive and unique, and that was interesting to me too. And it was that uh, combination of things that made, made me want to join. Um, and, and Bridgewater has been you know really successful over the 35 years before I joined, and I guess the 11 or 12 years since I've been there. It um, is a global macro investor, so we. We trade liquid markets around the world based on on deep understanding of the macroeconomic environment. And and then we take those ideas, that fundamental understanding, we systemize it, meaning we turn it into algorithms, which drive uh, our our perspectives and how we trade. And then we do that in a very diversified way across global markets. And so uh, it's been a a fabulous life experience and um, and someplace that... uh, through its ups and downs and its its institutional struggles or our individual struggles, you know, has been very focused on learning through failure, learning through evolution, and um, and so it's it's what psychologists I think or, or uh, sociologists would call a learning organization. And it's been a it's been a fun place to be part of. So you transitioned from the co CEO row to CEO of Bridgewater in 2020, and in fact, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And, and this marks obviously the, a new era for Bridgewater as, as Ray takes a less active role in the day-to-day management. It, it was also a very long transition. I, I think you mentioned something and Ray also talked about this as a 10-year transition uh, that, that kicked off back in 2010. So why did it take this long to transition? What were some of the challenges? And I, I also say this personally curious because I built this podcast uh, over the past two and a half years at Princeton. And I'm also handling off to, to, to more people. So I, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on that process. Yeah, I remember when Ray said 2010, we're gonna, he, he said in 2010, we're gonna have a 10 year transition. And I, I, I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, what, what could possibly take you know, 10 years? World War, World, World War II could have been fought twice <laughs> in, in, in a 10 year period. Uh, but the reason um, he was saying that is we had to transition ownership so he was the majority owner, and we had to, over time, buy down his ownership with outside investors or internal investors. Um, there was the management transition, which, I, which I'm part of. There was the investor transition where, you know, he was the dominant figure, and we needed to sort of build and help transition that uh, responsibility to others, even though Ray would continue to be part of it. And there's the governance transition. And so um, all those different uh, components took a long time, and, um, and it's hard to transition from a founder where you have this iconic founder and the organization really reflects that person to an institution, which it doesn't reflect any person. It doesn't reflect me. It reflects lots of people in a, in a common culture and so forth. And the key is to really move from where it's no longer about one person, but it's about a team of people coming together uh, for success. Um, so my role of, has evolved over time, but the, but the important part of the story, which is wasn't pleasant, but important history, is I had been at Bridgewater for a couple of years. So I guess uh, probably 2012 timeframe where I got a phone call and Ray asked me to become the co-CEO with one of, uh, with, with, with one of my partners and his, his protégés, Greg Jensen. And so Greg and I became co-CEO in 2012 and we're in that role for about 18 months when Ray came back and, and said in particular to me that I, he didn't think I was doing a good enough job 
And so he fired me from the co-CEO job. And um, he asked me to take a lesser job of with the title of president where I was responsible for a, a big part of our business, but I was no longer the CEO. And um, that was an incredibly hard moment um, for me. And it was very indicative of Bridgewater's culture where he made that decision. We didn't, we, by the way, we didn't agree on what was going on at the time. I thought he wanted to come back for a variety of reasons. He thought I wasn't going doing well enough. In retrospect, probably some of the were true on both sides, I definitely wasn't doing well enough. And, um, and so I really considered leaving Bridgewater uh, at that time. And I had um, some personal things going on that made me want to stay the course. I had some young children that had just moved to Connecticut. So I said, I'll give it a couple of years to try to sort through my, my personal situation. And um, in, the, in the course of those next couple of years, things started to go really well. And the job that I was doing went really well. And, um, and Bridgewater was very successful during that period. And so I was happy and I decided to stay. And then in 2016, uh, Ray came back to me and said, I'd like you to be the co-CEO again. And I thought about that and ultimately wasn't convinced that made sense um, because I really liked what I was doing and I had had that uh, not great experience the first time. And, um, and we agreed with a certain set of conditions that, that I would do it. And so I took that job in, in 2017. And, and then, as you said, it, it just transitioned um, uh, to, to CEO uh, uh, last year. The thing that's important about that is not so much the me in that role versus the co or whatever. It's the um, it's the evolution over time, the incremental transition from that one single person that's responsible for so much to a team of people that uh, hopefully can be successful and uh, continue to be no longer dependent on any single person, but uh, but an institution where there's lots of succession and uh, and capability. How do you maintain that kind of structure or thinking? as the founder gradually steps away and you institutionalize that process because we all know uh, th there's a very distinct way of Bridgewater's culture and thinking yeah. and the worldview, looking at the markets that is very much centered around Ray's vision initially. Yeah, well, it's a challenge because uh, his vision was pretty good. You know, he was pretty, he was pretty successful with his vision. And so um, you, wanna, you wanna not throw out the, you know, not throw that out uh, indiscriminately. You have to be really careful. On the side of the culture, uh, the way that I think about it, and I think many of us think about it, is it's our culture. So um, we have to, it was Ray's vision, but it's our culture now to, to operate with and live and to evolve in a way that makes sense. And so we, we, we have a lot of fidelity around Ray's principles. And think about that as the constitution, when you go to the National Archives and you see the copy of the Constitution in the glass box, that's the Constitution. But just like the, the Constitution evolves with, uh, with amendments, uh, we also evolve Bridgewater with amendments to the culture and, uh, and uh, try to make sure that we're reflecting what we're learning, what the challenges are, what the gaps are in the original principles that, that Ray had written. And, um, and so we're in the process of establishing that. And then you have to do that in a way where if you're the CEO, you're setting sort of a vision for how those decisions will be made and, and you have a view of how the culture should evolve. But it can't be, at least in my mind, it can't be Dave's next 10 amendments. It has to be a group of leaders that come together and say, oh, here's the problems we're having. Here's the gaps. Okay, we need to amend the culture. Here's the amendments to the principles. And do we agree on that? Okay, who disagrees? Let's bring in that disagreement and weigh that and talk about it and drive alignment, because um, I think that's a key part of being an institution that lives going forward. So it's a much more nuanced process and gradual process. It's not so much that you radically throw away everything or just a constitutionalist or something and just, just stick to, to the original ones. It's, it's a nuanced process. It's a, yeah, it's a balance. And uh, you know, it's one you do with a lot of humility. So you know, two things can be true at the same time. I mean, Ray is a brilliant person. Um, you know, it's, I could never have done what Ray did. So I come at this with a lot of humility. I, I think the culture he's created is really special and magnificent. So you have that reality. So you want to be, you want to be humble about any changes to that. And then you have the, the second thing, which is, okay, now we're leading the company. I'm leading the company. We're leading the company. And we see problems. And problems are fuel for evolution and change. And so you have to reconcile the old and the, and the, and the, and the foundation with the gaps that you see. And if you're thinking about, I mean, you know, if you think about, okay, well, our culture is not developmental enough. We're not helping people grow enough. Okay, how should we deal with that? Diversity and inclusion isn't integrated into our culture in a way that's systematic. 
like everything else we do is systematic. Okay, how are we going to deal with that? Um, there's not leadership. The word leadership is not in the principles. Uh, the principles talk about management. Well, what does leadership mean? And should we amend the culture or the principles to reflect the role of leadership as opposed to management? Things like that are front of mind. And that's how we drive our, our culture and our agenda going forward. David, maybe we could also talk a bit about uh, the time since last April, which were both uh, the time you took over from CEO and then also uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which a lot of things happened. So yeah. would you mind giving us a high level overview of what, some of the major market developments in the past year and also where you see things going forward? Well, for me, it was a little bit um, like the, the, the famous Yogi uh, uh, Bear line, which is, um, wait, let me just remember that. It's uh, deja vu all over again. Um, and that's the way uh, 2020 felt to me. Uh, Yogi Bear used to make that comment. And uh, because it had similarities to my experience as a tech entrepreneur, and I was running a, a public uh, tech company uh, in 1999, 2000, 2001, and the tech bubble burst. And the, the markets went crazy and it was an incredibly uh, challenging period for our business. And it really redefined how tech companies would um, would serve their clients. And it was a, it was sort of the, the burst of the tech bubble, um, you know, I guess now uh, 20 years ago. And it, and it felt had similarities to the, the being in the treasury in 2007, 2008, where you've got this enormous financial crisis and you're trying to lead your way through this period of uncertainty. So while those crises are different, they're the same in certain ways, which is uh, they require a certain type of leadership, in, in my view, to be able to work your way through it. It's sort of a recognition that um, you don't know most of what you need to know at the time such things happen. You have to maintain uh, complete calmness and equanimity because that's required to be able to process the new information as it, as it comes. Um, more times than not, you have to act and act quickly without um, enough knowledge. So your decision-making in a period of enormous ambiguity and uncertainty and um, you sort of have to come to grips with the fact that um, any decision or an imperfect decision is better than no decision. And, um, and you have to lead. You have to lead people in a way where you're caring and, um, and transparent to the extent you can be, but also decisive. And so, um, so it had echoes of all those things. Um, what was um, unique and challenging for us in that period is, um, and, and for many people, but there were certain aspects of it unique to us, is we had a certain set of positions on the market where when COVID hit, we, we lost uh, a lot of money in our portfolio. And so we, um, so we were down significantly in our portfolio, double digits um, by, the, by the end of March and spent the rest of the year um, trying to do three or four uh, things at the same time. One is make sense of the new environment because we're fiduciaries. We have to be thoughtful about how we handle uh, those circumstances with our own portfolio uh, to be responsible with our clients' money. Uh, so we, we're, it's, it's accelerating learning where people are working around the clock to make sense of the new dynamics. We're trying to help our clients navigate this because they're worried about our portfolio, but they're much more worried about their overall portfolio because we're usually a tiny piece of their portfolio. So how to make sense of this world for them. Um, we're dealing with uh, a new uh, form of work, which is work from home. Fortunately, we had had um, uh, technology capabilities that we had just put in place that allowed us to make that transition seamlessly. And then you're caring for people um, at a time when you're remote, you can't give them the normal sorts of care and support that are typically able, you're able to do in normal times. And they're dealing with their own fears and uncertainties. They're dealing with the lack of childcare. They're dealing with a sick parent. They're dealing with uh, their own uh, fears, or in some cases, sickness with COVID. And so um, that's the world you're confronted. And so the question is, how do you deal with that? And, um, and the way we try to deal with that was just in, in the way I said about those three or four principles around calmness, taking action, taking decisive action, learning, trying to be very transparent with our clients, trying to make sure we gain the insight quickly enough to be able to help them, and taking care of our people, including making some tough choices on our cost uh, to create the room for our stability of our business, but also investing in the things we needed we, to invest in to be able to navigate this, this storm. And so it was an incredibly challenging period. And I honestly think as an institution, we're better 
at the end of this than we were at the beginning, because it's like anything that I've experienced in life, trials and pressures and stresses, if they're not to the extreme where they kill you, ultimately, um, if you can come through them, make you stronger. And so I think we're stronger as leaders because we went through it. We learned a lot. I think we're stronger as a business. And, um, you know, the suffering of COVID was horrific um, and something we shouldn't, uh, shouldn't skate past. But organizationally, I think it, um, it forced us to confront some realities that was very helpful. Would you mind helping us make sense a bit about what happened dur during uh, COVID? Because it feels like some of the most dominant macro financial trends in the past 40 years really culminated in this dramatic inequality and social un unrest and where especially exacerbated the pandemic, you know, the dramatic fall of real interest rates build up in household and government debt, financialization of the real economy, decline in inflation uh, and, and decline in productivity growth and so on. And Bridgewater has put forth this framework to understand this and understand this, which is MP3, Monetary Policy 3. Yeah. So maybe you could help us piece all these things yeah. together. Here. Prior to, prior to uh, uh, the pandemic coming, Bridgewater had written somewhat extensively about a paradigm shift where the global economy and uh, developed economies in, in particular were transitioning from a world where the typical levers of policy which historically monetary policy has been the base of, um, of our response to economic challenges. That was certainly the case in 2008 uh, and uh, 2000 and 2007, eight and nine when I was in the treasury. Um, and that um, in a period of extended low interest rates um, and enormous, um, enormous use of quantitative easing, the capacity of traditional monetary policy to be used with the same fidelity to stimulate the economy uh, was diminished. And that ultimately uh, that paradigm shift would require policymakers to contemplate something called MP3, which was the combination of fiscal and monetary policy in a way that would, if used correctly, not only um, serve as a way to uh, increase liquidity and, um, and stimulate the economy, but also if the fiscal side of it was used uh, judiciously in a way to potentially enhance productivity, through some of the investments that would allow that to happen. So that was the thesis that preceded COVID. And then what happened with COVID um, was um, really, a, you know, a, I hope a hundred year storm in the sense that the ferocity of the pandemic um, really created two crises at once. It created the health crises, which we found ourselves very unprepared to deal with unprepared um, with the appropriate supplies, unprepared with um, obviously a vaccine and a capacity to, uh, to deploy a vaccine for quite some time, um, and, um, and, and sort of inadequate medical capabilities, medical facilities um, to deal with that health crisis. And that was coupled with an economic crisis where the, the real economy essentially went to zero. I mean, all activity or most activity came to a screeching halt. And you have those two things working in tandem. And it wasn't just a U.S. crisis. It was a global crisis, so, um, which magnifies the, both the health challenge and the uh, economic challenge. And so economic activity fell off a cliff. And, um, and so what happened in response to that was, was really unprecedented. If you think about 2008, 2009, when I was in the, um, when I was in the Treasury, the monetary response and the fiscal response were unprecedented in scale and scope. Um, for those of you who studied this period, uh, the TARP was the you know the sort of the fiscal support that came through, or part of the fiscal support. It was incredibly controversial. It was relatively small in magnitude compared to what happened this time. And the Trump administration, and the Congress responded with a magnitude, both both uh, on the monetary side, but also on the fiscal side. That's really been unprecedented and immediately started pushing money in a variety of ways into, into the economy. One could critique um, the design of that, but one, one should certainly acknowledge the scope and speed. It was quite impressive how quickly um, uh, that, that, uh, that policy response came about. And that um, began to avert what had been a huge multi-trillion dollar hole left in the economy, both the US economy and the global economy. And, um, and that we're still digging our way out of. And, um, and what you started to see over time 
um, which is the same thing we saw in 2000 and post 2008, 9, 10, 11, is a bifurcation, a divergence between uh, the financial markets and the real economy, where with the enormity of the, of the stimulus coming into the economy and those dollars looking for assets which they can invest in, you saw the stock market and assets in general uh, recover quite, quite well, even as the, the real economy um, was, was very slow to recover and there was a lot of damage, a lot of damage to individuals, a lot of economic damage to the economy. And we're just now starting to see as, the, as we have the, the health crisis under control and we start to see the real economy return, more of a, uh, more of a consistency, although not quite a consistency yet uh, between the two. And, um, and a final point on this, which is we don't know how this story ends. We don't know how this story ends. In 2008, 2009, one of the things that you know, I don't think was obvious to everybody at the time, wasn't certainly as obvious to me as it is now, is that the consequences of that enormous policy response in that period would be really exacerbating uh, the uh, wealth gap because the holders of real assets um, uh, post 2008, 2009 had the best 10 year period in modern history for assets. And those that didn't have assets, which are uh, definitionally the lowest quartile, the lowest half of the uh, economy in terms of real income and that kind of thing, didn't get any of that benefit because they didn't, for the most part, hold assets. We're seeing, um, we're in the midst of seeing a version of that. But this, this environment's um, more complicated, I think, than that environment for several reasons um, that we should just keep uh, front of mind. One is the, um, the degree of uh, division and polarization that exists within our political system. And so um, you don't see a lot of areas where Republicans and Democrats are coming together and you see in both parties, um, extreme sides of the party taking more and more in influence. And I think that's gonna make it harder to respond to whatever lies ahead. The second thing you see is a set of challenges around our international dynamics, US-China relations, U.S. relations with the rest of the world that will will bear on this as well, and um, and that creates a period of great uncertainty. I can talk more about what that uncertainty looks like, but that creates a great a period of great uncertainty that'll be challenging for policymakers to navigate and for um, and for individuals to navigate. That was so much to unpack, David. But I think I, I just want to uh, follow up on two two of the points you made. The first one, you said the bifurcation between financial markets and the real economy. Perhaps we're also seeing a bifurcation between market participants and policymakers sometimes. So for example, a very common sentiment today amongst market participants is that economists don't know what they're doing. The Federal Reserve policy have no idea what's happening in businesses and markets, especially with inflation. So Powell saying that inflation is not, is transitory today. It's like Ben Bernanke saying in 2007 that the housing market is contained. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that kind of bifurcation uh, on, on one hand, but also the second part you said about uncertainty how do you view the relationship between risk and uncertainty as you manage through this very turbulent times uh, and also combining with your experience back in the treasury? Yeah, well, I think, um, I think there are diverge divergences or uh, maybe said differently, at least ambiguities, uncertainties around the intersection of uh, business, uh, business needs, business um, agendas and, um, and policymakers. And there's been variations of that at various times in our history. But if you think of, of the role of big tech uh, in our country today, the enormous importance of 5G, artificial intelligence, quantum science to our national strength, to our economic strength, to our national security as a country. If you think of the enormity of that, if you think of the investment that the private sector is putting into those areas versus the public sector, um, it's it's a it's a huge um, huge difference. Um, what the public sector is putting in is a fraction of what the private sector is putting in, and yet how those technologies develop and how um, um, how they're deployed has huge implications for the future of our country. So that's just a reality. And so the question is, what is the right level of partnership, oversight, regulation, joint investment between? the private sector and the public sector in that arena. And I think our, our models of collaboration and thinking about such things are outdated without 
without going into how it could work or should work, it's clearly a case today that, that that's a gap that needs to be addressed. When you think about the emergence of crypto and what that, um, what that creates in terms of, uh, of financial markets, in terms of the ability to compensate um, in ways that are discreet and protected and outside the normal flow um, that's monitored by our authorities and what that means from a counterterrorism perspective or what that means from a market stability perspective or what that means from a regulatory perspective, um, without, without opining on which way it should go, it raises a whole new set of challenges. And so, um, you know, one of the things I found in government is you have this enormously talented group of people who are working so hard on our behalf. We're so lucky to have that group of people. And you get the benefit of new people coming in all the time who are coming in based on what political parties in office. But the depth of expertise that's required in these areas of technology, um, the public sector is far outgunned uh, by the private sector. And so that's a real dilemma as you think about uh, the future the future of our country. And I think it's going to be a source of tension, um, at a minimum, a source of tension and you know potentially a source of conflict. And we've seen uh, versions of that in the past. Just to touch on this intersection of economic policy and national security, which I know you're very passionate about. Uh, in the very recent Gilbert lecture that you delivered at Princeton, you made two very fascinating arguments about military in innovation today. One is that the line between civilian technology and military technology is more blurred than ever, and you brought up 5G and AI. Uh, the second point is that the military needs to create a culture of experimentation and bring in new entrants and create the right incentives for people to move up the risk curve. W would you mind telling us a bit more about these issues, which I know you're very passionate about? Well, I, when I was uh, in the government, my first job was in the um, Commerce Department, and I was the Undersecretary for uh, uh, Industry and Security. And that had the remit to give approvals and licenses to dual-use technology, which the technologies that had commercial uh, relevance, but also national security relevance, and it was those were controlled technologies. And it was a hard thing to do even then, because... Uh, you had to think about that globally, because if those supply chains were global, then it didn't matter what we did alone with the United States. And those technologies were changing so quickly that um, uh, they became mainstream. And, and the, the, the line between um, uh, commercial and, and national security was blurry even then. That, um, that blurriness has, and the significance of the te technologies has expanded dramatically. And so if you think about um, our military capacity and our ability to be defend uh, America's interest or fight the next war or whatever it is, it's going to be highly dependent on artificial intelligence, on our communications network, on quantum science. Those things will be foundational. A uh, semiconductor industry, those things are foundational to our success militarily. They're also foundational to our success economically. And so we now have to think about those technologies differently because the kinds of constraints you might put on them um, to protect the, na the national security uh, implications could strangle the economy. Um, the kinds of investments you need to make in those technologies um, might be orders of magnitude from a public sector perspective, orders of magnitude different than what they might have been even a decade ago. And the kinds of partnerships that you need to have with the, with the private sector and the government need to, to redefine what partnerships look like because we're in a whole new era. And so that kind of thinking, which is almost white, you know, white sheet thinking, you have to imagine the world that we're now in and forget all the architecture and the, way, the, the past assumptions um, is going to require a fundamental rethinking of government, in, in my opinion, the role of government and a fundamental rethinking of um, of, of the partnership with the private sector. You've argued that America's economic power underwrites its national security and necessitates a national innovation policy. Uh, what would such a policy look like? What would that kind of public private partnership look like? Is it just uh, the government spending more to address market failures when there are areas that don't have enough capital? Right. Well, um, this is an uncomfortable argument if you're a conservative, right? Because basically the idea that the government would, um, you know, put its finger on the scale for the private sector um, uh, is, is, is problematic. But I think our new reality is going to require a new way of thinking. And, and so, um, you know, a friend of mine, I gave a talk at Hoover and a friend of mine 
which is a conservative think tank. And a friend of mine said, what would Milton Friedman say? And I said, why? I don't, I'm not sure what Milton Friedman would say, but I think Milton Friedman, if I was going to have a debate with him, would have to acknowledge the world has changed and the free market's way of thinking about how the, the role the government plays in these particular technologies that are winner take all of, of, of enormous geopolitical significance, it may have to change as well. Now, the, the challenge is uh, within our wonderfully chaotic and inefficient and highly politicized system, which is still wonderful compared to all the others, is how do you put government, the government finger on the scale for those things that are most important and capture the private sector dynamics and profit motive in a way that's constructive. And so that's what you have to wrestle with. And old models of industrial policy where the government invests in you know, X companies or something like that, I think are, are gonna fail, or aren't gonna work. Um, and so some of the things we thought about is a, a set of principles that would guide how the government gets involved and, um, and would really adhere sharply uh, to only investing in sectors that are, are of particular geopolitical significance, uh, doing so in a way that really adheres to market principles and market dynamics. And so an example of that might be, uh, which, is, which is one that's drawn from China, where China's um, put an enormous amount of government resources in these sectors. Some of the things they've done, I, I wouldn't support. But one example, which I thought was quite good, was that they put government funding uh, in support of funds that were existing in that were focused on certain sectors. So imagine an artificial intelligence fund. And so the government would put money into that fund. The, the fund managers would be private capital allocators. And then the government would say, listen, um, we're going to take first loss on this fund and we're going to cap our return at 12%. And so by doing so, you juice the return on that fund, you reduce the risk, you juice the return, and that should draw even more capital uh, into that fund. And if you did that across multiple funds in the areas that were focused on the key technologies, it would be a way for the government to participate. And then the government's participation allows it also to be the beneficiary of the innovation that comes out the other end. That might be an example of how the government avoids some congressman from X state calling the Department of Defense and saying, you know, I want to get involved in this and corrupting it. Uh, with the politicization that's been the, the risk of industrial policy in the past. You brought up China, so perhaps we could also speak a little bit on that. The COVID pandemic's disruption of supply chains have really demonstrated some of the potential vulnerabilities that arise from this kind of dependence on China on, on supply chain issues. And the U.S. initially suffered a lot of logistical breakdowns for aspirin and penicillin and basic PPEs and so on. Uh, in light of the rising tension between China and the U.S., this kind of geopolitical risk, uh, do you think Western firms and countries should gradually retreat their dependence on China? And I also, not br I also know that Bridgewater has frequently spoken about Asia and China being the new frontier for investments, given that Western developed world now suffers from this historically low interest rates and yields. So I was just wondering why is Bridgewater so active in China when the geopolitical risk and ideological divisions seem to be at an all-time high? Yeah. So on the first question regarding supply chains, um, I think what happened in the pandemic is uh, America's dependence on a number of supply chains uh, became more evident than it, than it would have been to, 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 to many people. And I think you are going to see a retrenchment of, of some of those supply chains, either higher diversification, where you diversify the supply chain across a variety of countries, a variety of companies, not just China, but but a, a multitude. And um, I think you're going to also see some of those supply chains where um, the uh, the certain things are, are viewed as so critical to our economy, our national security uh, coming back. I don't think that's going to be, and you're already seeing that, either supply chain diversification or uh, supply chain retrenchment. And I think that's sort of a byproduct of, hey, the world's changed a lot. Um, in the last 15 years since I was in the government, you've seen these emergent technologies You've seen a, hu a huge increase in inter economic interdependence, and you've seen the emergence of, um, of cyber as, as drivers of the global economy. When I was in the government, all these things were nascent relative to where they are today. So yes, you're going to see that. In terms of uh, US-China, I think it's, uh, I honestly think it's a dramatically different uh, world than when I was in the government 15 years ago. And there was 
you know, some of this was on the horizon. And, um, you know, I have a particular personal view of this. I should say it's not Bridgewater's view. Should I should clarify it's my personal view. But, but I think the relationship has, it's the most important bi bilateral relationship in the world. And I think it, it is more strained uh, than it has been for quite some time. And that's bipartisan. There's um, those views on the U.S. side are hardening between Republicans and Democrats, and they're hardening on the Chinese side. And the regime under President Xi is, um, is a much more um, pro-China, um, strong, stronger view of China's role in the world than the previous regime. So you have those dynamics uh, that exist. And I think we're in a new era um, of, of what, what I think is appropriately called strategic, uh, great, great power strategic competition, where the United States and China are going to be competitive um, in certain arenas like these winner take, te winner take all technologies where the consequences of, of being dependent on the other are so consequential from an economic perspective and a national security perspective that, um, that America um, in this current political environment and probably strategically will not let itself be dependent. And I, I like, don't know as much about China, but I suspect the same would be true in China. And so I think that's gonna require a pretty sophisticated way to think about the relationship. And I think about it in three tiers. I think there's gonna be areas, and this is a US centric view, so let me acknowledge that up front. But if you're sitting in a US policymaker perspective, I think it's gonna be areas where we're just gonna compete. AI, 5G, I mean, the, the, and we're gonna to have to compete in a way that both leverages alliances, but also is very focused on building capability at home. I think there's gonna be um, a number of areas we have to co uh, cooperate. So climate change, non-proliferation, there's gonna be a huge dimension of the trading relationship that presumably can continue because it's not, it's not dependent on these critical technologies. And there's gonna be some areas where we just have fundamental disagreement. Human rights are gonna be an area we have disagreement. Religious freedoms might be an area we have disagreement. Um, Taiwan is an area or South China Sea, there's gonna be areas of disagreement. And the key is managing that relationship in a way that's direct and transparent, where we're dealing with both the agreement and the disagreement in a very focused and, and, uh, and, and structured way um, to uh, you know, uh, advance US interests if you're in the US side and advance China interests if you're in the China side. And so, um, and I think it's got a lot of risk associated with it. So I think it could be mismanaged um, because it's a challenge to be both very firm and focused on the agenda of your country um, at the same time, manage the realities of the global uh, uh, of the global landscape, uh, but that that's how that's how I I see the challenge going forward. And I think every Treasury Secretary, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense that is in place in the U.S. side over the next decade, how to manage this relationship will be uh, first and foremost on the agenda. David, I know we only have like five minutes left before we have to let you go. So maybe just to bring things home a bit. In your Gilbert Lecture at Princeton, you also said that the U.S. is at an inflection point and what the U.S. does next will be very important for the future of America's role in the world. Uh, and some of the domestic political and economic trends that we see, like rising inequality, lack of social mobility, decreased openness to high-skilled immigration and increased political polarization. What do you think of these trends? What are your uh, thoughts on, on, on whether you're optimistic uh, do you think these issues might be preventing the U.S. from maintaining a position as the world's superpower? I do. Yeah, I do think there are big problems. Um, I am a, a hugely optimistic person, so I'm optimistic that America will renew itself in the ways that are, are necessary. And I think our future in the world is much more important on what we do, much more dependent on what we do than what on China does or Russia or whatever. So I think the focus on dealing in a very forthright way with our challenges is really uh, critical. And the history books would show that that's happened again and again in American history. And we've risen to that challenge, but it won't happen if we don't acknowledge the risks and the, and the shortcomings. And there's two I'd, I'd like to highlight just with, with limited time. Um, one we've touched on. The first is, uh, is the inequality. And, um, and there's inequality inequality of wealth, inequality of income, all that. I, the inequality that, that is most stinging to me, the one that um, is the one that I worry the most about is the inequality of opportunity. And what that means is that for you know, the first time in, in American history, parents think that their kids, American children are less likely to have 
a better life than they had. And the power of America has always been that if you come and you work hard and you're in, in you know, you're, you're entrepreneurial, you can be anything. It doesn't matter where you start, you can end anywhere. And that's been why we, we've been such a beacon for skilled immigration. It's been why, uh, why our system has created so much success and innovation. And for the first time now, if you see the economic, social economic strata, um, it's very unlikely that someone born in the fourth quartile, fourth quartile will end in the first quartile. Even in my time, when I, I was born into the fourth quartile or maybe the second, the third quartile, um, you know, I, I wasn't limited. Um, you know, the kids I grew up with weren't limited. And I think that's a real problem. It's a complex problem because it goes down to education. It gets down to um, health care. It gets down to a system that um, allows for that opportunity to make itself available to to, to everybody, regardless of uh, what family they're from, where they start. That's a real problem. And it's going to have to be dealt with in a comprehensive and systematic way. And that worries me a lot. The second problem is uh, the lack of funding and focus on innovation. And um, you have uh, basic R&D budgets, uh, uh, national R&D budgets uh, in, the, in the government today are about uh, 40% of what they were 50 or 60 years ago. So we are under-investing in, in our future. And we're underinvesting in the kinds of things we need to be the sort of geo uh, technological powerhouse that um, that I that I hope we will be. And so those two areas, among many others, need to be addressed. And I'm optimistic that uh, with time and the and the right debate, we'll, we'll address them. So since the name of our show is Policy Punchline, as my last question, I always ask my guests, what would your punchline be for this interview? My punchline uh, is, is, man, it's all about the right people tackling these problems in our country. And so, um, you know, I've been in, I've been in my, my career has spanned, I guess, 30, 35 years now. Uh, and I've had a lot of public sector experience, a lot of private sector experience. I feel grateful for everything I've had, but nothing has given me the joy and satisfaction and sense of fulfillment that my time in the military and my time in the government did. And um, we need the smartest, most ambitious, most energetic, most uncompromising people in our country to take on this challenge. It's, it's, your, it's your country. I've had my American dream. It's yours to have. And, uh, but it'll only be there if you, uh, if you grab it and make it what it is. So, um, so I hope you'll, I hope you'll all uh, stand up to that challenge. That's a wonderful punchline to, to end this uh, show, show on. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, David. nice to see you. Good, good luck. I know you're on your way out the door here. Uh, congratulations and good luck. Thank you so much for listening. That was my interview with David McCormick, who is the CEO of Bridgewater Associates, the world's largest hedge fund. Thank you so much for listening today. Please follow us on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud. You may find the video of this interview on YouTube. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.